first time I encountered cancer was when I was five years old. We, I grew up in an immigrant uh, neighborhood in Thessaloniki, Greece. We were living in this uh, second floor apartment, um, and I was looking uh, outside the window, you know, and reaching out and looking at the world outside. It was a beautiful world, fascinating world. Kids were playing soccer, the mothers uh, were going shopping in the square, the fathers were going to, to work. Um, I remember this young man, he must have been about 20 years old, he was walking in front of the house, uh, wearing this white uh, uniform, going to this military academy, medical school. It was very difficult to get to that school, so uh, he was the pride of the neighborhood. One day, my mother was talking to a neighbor of hers uh, down the street, and I remember this sad look in her, in her face when she found out that the young man died of cancer, the bad disease, as they called it. That look remained with me the rest of my life. I'm sure, uh, like me, most of you have encountered cancer many times. Your neighbors, your friends, family. Both my parents died of cancer in the early 70s, and those were some of the worst times of my life. When I was 20 years old, I came to the United States to study electrical engineering. That was the, the, the field uh, on the brink at the time. The PCs were coming out. Uh, Steve Jobs was trying to introduce the Macintoshes in the universities. So I studied electrical engineering for a few years, both bachelor's and master's, but I kept having that longing to work on, on a medical field, to somehow use my engineering skills perhaps in, uh, in biology and medicine. Maybe I can understand cancer better. So I went for my PhD to Boston University where there was a new school uh, in biomedical engineering, and that's where I met uh, Charles DeLisi the guy on the left. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, a um, uh, uh, few years before I, uh, I, I met him, he fought to start the Human Genome Project. Uh, he and others thought that uh, the only way we could really move forward with medicine and by understanding biology is by uncovering the secrets that they are hidden in the human genome. Um, so, it was a very ambitious project. Most people thought it can be done. Uh, it was too expensive and too time consuming to finish this, you know, three billion letters of code. But Charles thought that uh, the, the project will push new technologies to come forward and uh, engineers to come and work on the problem and it will be cheaper, eventually cheaper and faster to do it. Well, he was right. He put the first $30 million, uh, as he just told me earlier, uh, for the project but the actual project cost about $2 billion. Best $2 billion we ever spent, if you ask me. Much, much more important than the PC, and that's coming from an electrical engineer. <laughs> so uh, uh, Charles DeLisi and Jim Cornette, that they're both here today, mentored me through my transition from engineering to biomedical sciences. But it was when I went to NIH that, that I got into this new field called bioinformatics which is tasked with this enormous uh, problem to try to read all the information that's coming out of the human genome and genomics experiments. So what is the human genome? Imagine a small library with about 3,000 books, the size of the Bible. The Bible has about a million letters, so it's gonna make, make us uh, three billion letters this way. And these books are stacked into different book cells representing the chromosomes, chromosomes 1 to 22 and X and Y. All this information is in the middle of the cell. Actually, there are two uh, identical cells of information, almost identical cells of information. One comes from your mother, one comes from your father, inside there. Just in case some of the information in one part is wrong, the, the cell can use the information from the other cell. So if you have little discrepancies somewhere there, you can use the other self to read it. Of course, if you're missing the other self, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> well, this is what happens to cancer cells. The, a cancer changes the information, deletes information, or changes the information in a way to make the cell become more aggressive. So what do I mean by that? Imagine that the cell is like a city, like Minneapolis, uh, where the library is right in the middle of the city and every worker in the city has to tap into that library to figure out what they do. So we don't need a governor here, we just have this library to do this. 
um, so it's a library information system, and uh, if the information is correct, you get the right information. If you're a policeman and you know where the crimes are or the, the murders, or you know, you know where to go and try to resolve them. If you are a snow plier, uh, plow driver in a snowy day, you tap in, you figure out what time you need to get your trucks out and which highways to concentrate on. If that information is wrong or missing, we got a traffic mess. So that's what's happening in cells, in cancer cells. The information is missing. This is a genome of a cancer patient. All the chromosomes are represented here. Chromosome one on top in this box, and when you have a little uh, gray dot, that means you have that part of the information correct. But if you have red dots or blue dots, something is wrong. This is a normal genome. So this cancer genome on chromosome six has a big deletion. That means a lot of those cells on chromosome six are just gone. Or it has an amplification on X chromosome, which means that there was duplicated information, and we know that's not good either. Or in that case, back there, you have exchange of information between chromosomes, between chromosomes two and 16 in that case. It's like taking little paragraphs or books from one chromosome and put them on the other. You start with a romance story and you end up with a zombie story. <laughs> so all this is not good. This is the cancer genome of a different patient. Notice that it is completely different than the other one. Maybe there is a deletion on chromosome six, so there is some you know, commonality here. But, but it was quite different than the other one I showed you. And we've done thousands of those, uh, more than 1,000 at Mayo, Cl Mayo Clinic alone, and we're finding that those genomes are different from one patient to another. So that becomes a big problem, right? We have to become detectives now and figure out what is going on with all this information we're getting. And if there are any commonalities, and how we can use these commonalities to understand how to treat that patient better. Those common things, we call them biomarkers, especially if they're associated with a clinical outcome. This is a different patient. This was a patient that had a very aggressive cancer, and when, you know, when, when he came to Mayo, he came out, you know, out of hospice. But there was an inhibitor that this patient took, and pretty much he went back to work. And after we analyzed the genome, we found out exactly why this gene over there, called ALK, was a good target for that inhibitor, and we could figure it out by doing this genomic analysis. So this is something we couldn't do three or four years ago. This is really, really new data, new technologies, new power that we have. There is an oncologist at uh, Mayo, Arizona, his name is Mitesh Borat, that already is using this type of technologies and he's seeing 10 to 20 per percent of the patients that now can go uh, uh, and, and find their lives back. People that they didn't have any chances, any options, now they have options with, with this type of technologies. So how do we do that? How can we do this? We need the following technologies. First, to, first of all, we need pathologists, really, good trained pathologists who know how to pick up the right cells from the, from the tumor and so that we can interrogate those cells. We need molecular biologists like Steve and Lynn here who are taking that, those, uh, the, 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 those molecules and they can put them into high throughput technologies like this one, which is a lot of sequencing and arrays. Uh, when Charles started the Human Genome Project 30 years ago, we could sequence one fragment with $1,000 in about a week. Now we can sequence 100 million of those fragments with the same money and time. So our ability to figure out what is going on into the cells is 100 million times better now. And finally, we get all this information. It's multiple libraries of information, which you cannot go and read by, by eye, obviously. So you need computers and algorithms to understand what this information is really telling you. And that's what I do. I write algorithms to understand that information and somehow link it with biological information. 15 years ago, I found myself exactly what I wanted to be at Mayo Clinic, one of the best clinical institutions in the world, 
And finally, I could maybe try to do what I was trained to do, what I was trying to do since I was uh, uh, little. Uh, the person who hired me is uh, Frank Prenegast. He was one of the first leaders at Mayo Clinic who understood or realized that the genomics are going to, gen to change uh, uh, medicine and how we treat patients. And early on in my career at Mayo, I met John Seville, who was also very curious to see how genomics will influence his own field, which was pathology. The three of us shared the same vision that after we do the genomics of patients, we will be able to find these biomarkers, and biomarkers will help us uh, reduce overtreatment, for example, or do better undertreatment studies, or even know how to target the right patient with the right dark, uh, drug. So we developed this program, biomarker discovery program, within the Center of Individualized Medicine to do just that, find the next biomarkers that we would need to treat patients better. What we realized very early is that the only way we can do that is with teams of investigators, that one person alone cannot do this because it's just too complex and too difficult to do it. And the teams would require all the disciplines that I'm showing here, the clinicians, the pathologists, who will actually ask the right questions you know, for, for finding the biomarkers, the molecular biologists, the, the, the biostatisticians, the biofermenticians who will analyze all this information. And we also realize that those teams will have to operate around patient needs. And patients here are extremely important. If it wasn't for brave patients that would come to us and say, yes, we want to help you do this. We want to participate. That was extremely important for us to have the patients. And also the benefactors that would come and give us resources to be able to do those things. The teams also took advantage of all the resources that a big institution like Mayo has. For example, uh, an integrated practice, a large amount of uh, samples with annotated samples that they have the right information in them. Uh, world's, uh, one of the best uh, uh, reference laboratories that where we can take the biomarkers and quickly develop the test and launch it and, and offer it to the patients. So what do those biomarkers do? I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. In prostate cancer, one of the biggest problems that Jeff Carnes, a urologist in the team said, is we don't know how to treat a patient that comes with a positive biopsy. Some patients need surgery, but some patients don't need it, really. Like for example, this is a prostate. These are all prostates. And this is a slice of a prostate. And this is the cancer, a big, ugly cancer that needs to be taken out. Here, though, there is an, another prostate that has a very small cancer. And when they took it out, they are thinking, what, did we really need to take this out? $35,000, $50,000 uh, surgery, and all the morbidity issues that that patient might have, the change of life, the quality of life. Uh, did, we, did we really need to do that? It turns out that if you look at the 200,000 surgeries that were, that were done in prostate cancer every year, about 100,000 didn't need to do the surgery. If you multiply that with 50,000, that's $5 billion we can save to the system if we can come up with a, with a way to figure that out at the biopsy level so we don't go to surgery. So what we did is we took cancers from indolent, intermediate, and aggressive cancers. We did the genomes of those, and we look for those biomarkers that could classify patients either on the left or on the right, and then came up with a model where we can apply those biomarkers and we can tell the new patient if they have low risk for aggressive disease or high and send them to surgery. In a different uh, uh, project, uh, Marie-Christine Abri and other pathologists uh, wanted to know in lung cancer when there are patients with, that they have two tumors in their lungs, like in this case, and there are two tumors in those lungs, if those are independent or metastasis of one another. If there were metastases of one another, that's probably aggressive disease, high stage disease, and it's likely not gonna benefit from surgery. But if they're independent, that could be a stage one disease, each one of them, they can probably go to surgery and perhaps be cured by that. So it's extremely important to figure out if those two tumors are related or independent from each other. Well, it turns out that whole genome sequences can, can tell you that. On the top is a patient that had independent tumors, where on the bottom, obviously, it doesn't take an oncology degree to see that those two patterns <laughs> are kind of similar, right? 
So the patient below will have to go to chemotherapy, where the patient on top can go to surgery. Now we're developing a test where we can do this now for our patients. And even further, what we have realized many times is that a lot of the DNA, the altered DNA from the cancer, ends up in the blood of the patient. And that opens up a lot of interesting opportunities. Like, for example, we could take the tumor out, figure out what are the alterations and the breakpoints on that patient, and then go into the blood and monitor that patient. So if, this, if, it was, if a surgery was done, you can figure out this way if a patient relapses earlier. But there is another much more interesting uh, application for this, which has to do with uh, therapy. A patient with aggressive cancer, which, which is starting to metastasize, costs about half a million dollars to the, to, the, to the system right now. And many times this is because oncologists try some chemotherapies and it takes months before they know that it's working. A system like that can tell us if a patient is responding to therapy, and if it's not responding to therapy, we can stop the therapy earlier, save money to the system, and perhaps send the patient to a different therapy, which is more targeted in that case. So I try to give you some examples of how we, are, we can use genomics to, to, to change clinical practice. I think we are at war with cancer. We're not winning that war yet, but what we've done with genomics, we are started understanding how cancer thinks. And finally, I think we're winning some battles. And that would have not been done without people like Charles Delisi, Jim Cornette, Frank Prendergast, who actually gave their lives to work on this and bring genomics to NIH, to, um, to universities, and to clinical institutions. And also for me, I wouldn't be here if my mother didn't put this thing in, in, in me, in my mind. So I hope there is a smile in her face right now. Thank you. Yeah. First off. <laughs>